section thirty seven of shirley by charlotte bronte this librivox recording is in the public domain the winding up yes reader we must settle accounts now i've only briefly to narrate the final fates of some of the personages whose acquaintance we have made in this narrative and then you and i must shake hands and for the present separate let us turn to the curates to the much-loved though long neglected come forward modest merit malone i see promptly answers the invocation he knows his own description when he hears it no peter augustus we can have nothing to say to you it won't do impossible to trust ourselves with the touching tale of your deeds and destinies are you not aware peter that a discriminating public has its crotchets that the unvarnished truth does not answer that plain facts will not digest do you not know that the squeak of the real pig is no more relished now than it was in days of yore were i to give the catastrophe of your life and conversation the public would sweep off in shrieking hysterics and there would be a wild cry for sal volatile and burnt feathers impossible would be pronounced here untrue would be responded there inartistic would be solemnly decided note well whenever you present the actual simple truth it is somehow always denounced as a lie they disown it cast it off throw it on the parish whereas the product of your own imagination the mere figment the sheer fiction is adopted petted termed pretty proper sweetly natural the little spurious wretch gets all the comfits the honest lawful bantling all the cuffs such is the way of the world peter and as you are the legitimate urchin rude unwashed and naughty you must stand down make way for mr sweeting here he comes with his lady on his arm the most splendid and the weightiest woman in yorkshire mrs sweeting formerly miss dora sykes they were married under the happiest auspices mr sweeting having been just inducted to a comfortable living and mr sykes being in circumstances to give dora a handsome portion they lived long and happily together beloved by their parishioners and by a numerous circle of friends there i think the varnish has been put on very nicely advance mr dunn this gentleman turned out admirably far better than either you or i could possibly have expected reader he too married a most sensible quiet ladylike little woman the match was the making of him he became an exemplary domestic character and a truly active parish priest as a pastor he to his dying day conscientiously refused to act the outside of the cup and platter he burnished up with the best polishing powder the furniture of the altar and temple he looked after with the zeal of an upholsterer the care of a cabinet maker his little school his little church his little parsonage all owed their erection to him and they did him credit each was a model in its way if uniformity and taste in architecture had been the same thing as consistency and earnestness in religion what a shepherd of a christian flock mr dunn would have made there was one art in the mastery of which nothing mortal ever surpassed mr dunn it was that of begging by his own unassisted efforts he begged all the money for all his erections in this matter he had a grasp of plan a scope of action quite unique he begged of high and low of the shoeless cottage brat and the coroneted duke he sent out begging letters far and wide to old queen charlotte to the princesses her daughters to her sons the royal dukes to the prince regent to lord castlereagh to every member of the ministry then in office 
and what is more remarkable he screwed something out of every one of these personages it is on record that he got five pounds from the close-fisted old lady queen charlotte and two guineas from the royal profligate her eldest son when mr dunn set out on begging expeditions he armed himself in a complete suit of brazen mail that you had given a hundred pounds yesterday was with him no reason why you should not give two hundred to-day he would tell you so to your face and ten to one get the money out of you people gave to get rid of him after all he did some good with the cash he was useful in his day and generation perhaps i ought to remark that on the premature and sudden vanishing of mr malone from the stage of briarfield parish you cannot know how it happened reader your curiosity must be robbed to pay your elegant love of the pretty and pleasing there came as his successor another irish curate mr mccarthy i am happy to be able to inform you with truth that this gentleman did as much credit to his country as malone had done it discredit he proved himself as decent decorous and conscientious as peter was rampant boisterous and this last epithet i choose to suppress because it would let the cat out of the bag he laboured faithfully in the parish the schools both sunday and day schools flourished under his sway like green bay trees being human of course he had his vaults these however were proper steady-going clerical faults what many would call virtues the circumstance of finding himself invited to tea with a dissenter would unhinge him for a week the spectacle of a quaker wearing his hat in the church the thought of an unbaptized fellow-creature being interred with christian rites these things could make strange havoc in mr mccarthy's physical and mental economy otherwise he was sane and rational diligent and charitable i doubt not a justice-loving public will have remarked ere this that i have thus far shown a criminal remissness in pursuing catching and bringing to condign punishment the would-be assassin of mr robert moore here was a fine opening to lead my willing readers a dance at once decorous and exciting a dance of law and gospel of the dungeon the dock and the dead thrall you might have liked it reader but i should not i in my subject would presently have quarrelled and then i should have broken down i was happy to find that facts perfectly exonerated me from the attempt the murderer was never punished for the good reason that he was never caught the result of the further circumstance that he was never pursued the magistrates made a shuffling as if they were going to rise and do valiant things but since moore himself instead of urging and leading them as heretofore lay still on his little cottage couch laughing in his sleeve and sneering with every feature of his pale foreign face they considered better of it and after fulfilling certain indispensable forms prudently resolved to let the matter quietly drop which they did mr moore knew who had shot him and all briarfield knew it was no other than michael hartley the half-crazed weaver once before alluded to a frantic antinomian in religion and a mad leveller in politics the poor soul died of delirium tremens a year after the attempt on moore and robert gave his wretched widow a guinea to bury him the winter is over and gone spring has followed with beamy and shadowy with flowery and showery flight we are now in the heart of summer in mid-june the june of eighteen twelve it is burning weather the air is deep azure and red gold it fits the time it fits the age it fits the present spirit of the nations the nineteenth century wantons in its giant adolescence the titan boy uproots mountains in his game and hurls rocks in his wild sport this summer bonaparte is in the saddle he and his host scour russian deserts he has with him frenchmen and poles italians and children of the rhine 
six hundred thousand strong he marches on old moscow under old moscow's walls the rude cossack waits him barbarian stoic he waits without fear of the boundless ruin rolling on he puts his trust in a snow-cloud the wilderness the wind and the hailstorm are his refuge his allies are the elements air fire water and what are these three terrible archangels ever stationed before the throne of jehovah they stand clothed in white girdled with golden girdles they uplift vials brimming with the wrath of god their time is the day of vengeance their signal the word of the lord of hosts thundering with the voice of his excellency hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail which i have reserved against the time of trouble against the day of battle and war go your ways pour out the vials of the wrath of god upon the earth it is done the earth is scorched with fire the sea becomes as the blood of a dead man the islands flee away the mountains are not found in this year lord wellington assumed the reins in spain they made him generalissimo for their own salvation's sake in this year he took badajos he fought the field of vittoria he captured pampeluna he stormed san sebastian in this year he won salamanca men of manchester i beg your pardon for this slight resume of warlike facts but it is of no consequence lord wellington is for you only a decayed old gentleman now i rather think some of you have called him a dotard you have taunted him with his age and the loss of his physical vigour what fine heroes you are yourselves men like you have a right to trample on what is mortal in a demigod scoff at your ease your scorn can never break his grand old heart but come friends whether quakers or cotton printers let us hold a peace congress and let out our venom quietly we have been talking with unseemly zeal about bloody battles and butchering generals we arrive now at a triumph in your line on the eighteenth of june eighteen twelve the orders of council were repealed and the blockaded ports thrown open you know very well such of you as are old enough to remember you made yorkshire and lancashire shake with your shout on that occasion the ringers cracked a bell in briarfield belfry it is dissonant to this day the association of merchants and manufacturers dined together at stilbro and one and all went home in such a plight as their wives would never wish to witness more liverpool started and snorted like a river horse roused amongst his reeds by thunder some of the american merchants felt threatenings of apoplexy and had themselves bled all likewise men at this first moment of prosperity prepared to rush into the bowels of speculation and to delve new difficulties in whose depths they might lose themselves at some future day stocks which had been accumulating for years now went off in a moment in the twinkling of an eye warehouses were lightened ships were laden work abounded wages rose the good times seemed come these prospects might be delusive but they were brilliant to some they were even true at that epoch in that single month of june many a solid fortune was realized when a whole province rejoices the humblest of its inhabitants tastes a festal feeling the sound of public bells rouses the most secluded abode as if with a call to be gay and so caroline hellstone thought when she dressed herself more carefully than usual on the day of this trading triumph and went attired in her neatest muslin to spend the afternoon at fieldhead there to superintend certain millinery preparations for a great event the last appeal in these matters being reserved for her unimpeachable taste she decided on the wreath the veil the dress to be worn at the altar she chose various robes and fashions for more ordinary occasions without much reference to the bride's opinion that lady indeed being in a somewhat impracticable mood lewis had presaged difficulties and he had found them in fact his mistress had shown herself exquisitely provoking putting off her marriage day by day 
week by week month by month at first coaxing him with soft pretences of procrastination and in the end rousing his whole deliberate but determined nature to revolt against her tyranny at once so sweet and so intolerable it had needed a sort of tempest shock to bring her to the point but there she was at last fettered to a fixed day there she lay conquered by love and bound with a vow thus vanquished and restricted she pined like any other chained denizen of deserts her captor alone could cheer her his society only could make amends for the lost privilege of liberty in his absence she sat or wandered alone spoke little and ate less she furthered no preparations for her nuptials lewis was himself obliged to direct all arrangements he was virtually master of field head weeks before he became so nominally the least presumptuous the kindest master that ever was but with his lady absolute she abdicated without a word or a struggle go to mr moore ask mr moore was her answer when applied to for orders never was wooer of wealthy bride so thoroughly absolved from the subaltern part so inevitably compelled to assume a paramount character in all this mill skildar partly yielded to her disposition but a remark she made a year afterwards proved that she partly also acted on system lewis she said would never have learned to rule if she had not ceased to govern the incapacity of the sovereign had developed the powers of the premier it had been intended that miss hellstone should act as bridesmaid at the approaching nuptials but fortune had destined her another part she came home in time to water her plants she had performed this little task the last flower attended to was a rose tree which bloomed in a quiet green nook at the back of the house this plant had received the refreshing shower she was now resting a minute near the wall stood a fragment of sculptured stone a monkish relic once perhaps the base of a cross she mounted it that she might better command the view she had still the watering-pot in one hand with the other her pretty dress was held lightly aside to avoid trickling drops she gazed over the wall along some lonely fields beyond three dust trees rising side by side against the sky beyond the solitary thorn at the head of a solitary lane far off she surveyed the dusk moors where bonfires were kindling the summer evening was warm the bell music was joyous the blue smoke of the fires looked soft their red flame bright above them in the sky whence the sun had vanished twinkled the silver point the star of love caroline was not unhappy that evening far otherwise but as she gazed she sighed and as she sighed a hand circled her and rested quietly on her waist caroline thought she knew who had drawn near she received the touch unstartled i'm looking at venus mamma see she is beautiful how white her lustre is compared with the deep red of the bonfires the answer was a closer caress and caroline turned and looked not into mrs pryor's matron face but up at a dark manly visage she dropped her watering-pot and stepped down from the pedestal i've been sitting with mamma an hour said the intruder i've had a long conversation with her where meantime have you been to fieldhead surely is as naughty as ever robert she will neither say yes nor no to any question put she sits alone i cannot tell whether she is melancholy or nonchalant if you rouse her or scold her she gives you a look half wistful half reckless which sends you away as queer and crazed as herself what lewis will make of her i cannot tell for my part if i were a gentleman i think i would not dare undertake her never mind them they were cut out for each other lewis strange to say likes her all the better for these freaks he will manage her if any one can she tries him however he has had a stormy courtship for such a calm character but you see it all ends in victory for him caroline i have sought you to ask an audience why are those bells ringing for the repeal of your terrible law the orders you hate so much you are pleased are you not yesterday evening at this time i was packing some books for a sea voyage they were the only possessions except some clothes seeds roots and tools which i felt free to take with me to canada i was going to leave you to leave me to leave me her little fingers fastened on his arm she spoke and looked affrighted not now not now examine my face yes look at me well is the despair of parting legible thereon she looked into an illuminated countenance whose characters were all beaming 
though the page itself was dust this face potent in the majesty of its traits shed down on her hope fondness delight will the repeal do you good much good immediate good she inquired the repeal of the orders in council saves me now i shall not turn bankrupt now i shall not give up business now i shall not leave england now i shall be no longer poor now i can pay my debts now all the cloth i have in my warehouses will be taken off my hands and commissions given me for much more this day lays for my fortunes a broad firm foundation on which for the first time in my life i can securely build caroline devoured his words she held his hand in hers she drew a long breath you are saved your heavy difficulties are lifted they are lifted i breathe i can act at last oh providence is kind thank him robert i do thank providence and i also for your sake she looked up devoutly now i can take more workmen give better wages lay wiser and more liberal plans do some good be less selfish now caroline i can have a house a home which i can truly call mine and now he paused for his deep voice was checked and now he resumed now i can think of marriage now i can seek a wife this was no moment for her to speak she did not speak will caroline who meekly hopes to be forgiven as she forgives will she pardon all i have made her suffer all that long pain i have wickedly caused her all that sickness of body and mind she owed to me will she forget what she knows of my poor ambition my sordid schemes will she let me expiate these things will she suffer me to prove that as i once deserted cruelly trifled wantonly injured basely i can now love faithfully cherish fondly treasure tenderly his hand was in caroline still a gentle pressure answered him is caroline mine caroline is yours i will prize her the sense of her value is here in my heart the necessity for her society is blended with my life not more jealous shall i be of the blood whose flow moves my pulses than of her happiness and well-being i love you too robert and will take faithful care of you will you take faithful care of me faithful care as if that rose should promise to shelter from tempest this hard gray stone but she will care for me in her way these hands will be the gentle ministrants of every comfort i can taste i know the being i seek to entwine with my own will bring me a solace a charity a purity to which of myself i am a stranger suddenly caroline was troubled her lip quivered what flutters my dove asked moore as she nestled to and then uneasily shrank from him poor mamma i'm all mamma has must i leave her do you know i thought of that difficulty i and mamma have discussed it tell me what you wish what you would like and i will consider if it is possible to consent but i cannot desert her even for you i cannot break her heart even for your sake she was faithful when i was false was she not i never came near your sick-bed and she watched it ceaselessly what must i do anything but leave her at my wish you never shall leave her she may live very near us with us only she will have her own rooms and servant for this she stipulates herself you know she has an income that with her habits makes her quite independent she told me that with a gentle pride that reminded me of somebody else she is not at all interfering and incapable of gossip i know her carrie but if instead of being the personification of reserve and discretion she were something quite opposite i should not fear her yet she will be your mother-in-law the speaker gave an arch little nod moore smiled lewis and i are not of the order of men who fear their mothers-in-law carrie our foes never have been nor will be those of our own household i doubt not my mother-in-law will make much of me that she will in her quiet way you know she is not demonstrative and when you see her silent or even cool you must not fancy her displeased it is only a manner she has 
but be sure to let me interpret for her whenever she puzzles you you always believe my account of the matter robert oh implicitly jesting apart i feel that she and i will suit on ne peut mieux hortense you know is exquisitely susceptible in our french sense of the word and not perhaps always reasonable in her requirements yet dear honest girl i never painfully wounded her feelings or had a serious quarrel with her in my life no you are most generously considered indeed most tenderly indulgent to her and you will be considerate with mamma you are a gentleman all through robert to the bone and nowhere so perfect a gentleman as at your own fireside a eulogium i like it is very sweet i am well pleased my caroline should view me in this light mamma just thinks of you as i do not quite i hope she does not want to marry you don't be vain but she said to me the other day my dear mr moore has pleasing manners he is one of the few gentlemen i have seen who combine politeness with an air of sincerity mamma is rather a misanthropist is she not not the best opinion of the sterner sex she forbears to judge them as a whole but she has her exceptions whom she admires lewis and mr hall and of late yourself she did not like you once i knew that because she would never speak of you but robert well what now what is the new thought you have not seen my uncle yet i have mamma called him into the room he consents conditionally if i prove that i can keep a wife i may have her and i can keep her better than he thinks better than i choose to boast if you get rich you will do good with your money robert i will do good you shall tell me how indeed i have some schemes of my own which you and i will talk about on our own hearth one day i have seen the necessity of doing good i have learned the downright folly of being selfish caroline i foresee what i will now foretell this war must ere long draw to a close trade is likely to prosper for some years to come there may be a brief misunderstanding between england and america but that will not last what would you think if one day perhaps ere another ten years elapse lewis and i divide briarfield parish betwixt us lewis at any rate is certain of power and property he will not bury his talents he is a benevolent fellow and has besides an intellect of his own of no trifling calibre his mind is slow but strong it must work it may work deliberately but it will work well he will be made magistrate of the district surely says he shall she would proceed impetuously and prematurely to obtain for him this dignity if he would let it but he will not as usual he will be in no haste ere he has been master of fieldhead a year all the district will feel his quiet influence and acknowledge his unassuming superiority a magistrate is wanted they will in time invest him with the office voluntarily and unreluctantly everybody admires his future wife and everybody will in time like him he is of the pate generally approved the bon comme le pain daily bread for the most fastidious good for the infant and the aged nourishing for the poor wholesome for the rich surely in spite of her whims and oddities her dodges and delays has an infatuated fondness for him she will one day see him as universally beloved as even she could wish he will also be universally esteemed considered consulted depended on too much so his advice will be always judicious his help always good-natured ere long both will be in inconvenient request he will have to impose restrictions as for me if i succeed as i intend to do my success will add to his and shirley's income i can double the value of their mill property i can line yonder barren hollow with lines of cottages and rows of cottage gardens robert and root up the copse the copse shall be firewood ere five years elapse the beautiful wild ravine shall be a smooth descent the green natural terrace shall be a paved street there shall be cottages in the dark ravine and cottages on the lonely slopes the rough pebbled track shall be an even firm broad black sooty road bedded with the cinders from my mill and my mill caroline my mill shall fill its present yard horrible you will change our blue hill country air into the still bro smoke atmosphere i will pour the waters of pactolus through the valley of briarfield i like the beck a thousand times better i will get an act for enclosing nunnally common and parceling it out into farms still bro more however defies you thank heaven what can you grow in bilberry moss what will flourish on rush edge caroline the houseless the starving the unemployed shall come to hollow's mill from far and near and joe scott shall give them work and lewis moore esquire shall let them a tenement and mrs gill shall meet them 
a portion till the first pay-day she smiled up in his face such a sunday school as you will have carry such collections as you will get such a day school as you and shirley and miss ainley will have to manage between you the mill shall find salaries for a master and mistress and the squire or the clothier shall give a treat once a quarter she mutely offered a kiss an offer taken unfair advantage of to the extortion of about a hundred kisses extravagant day eat dreams said moore with a sigh and a smile yet perhaps we may realize some of them meantime the dew is falling mrs moore i shall take you in it is august the bells clash out again not only through yorkshire but through england from spain the voice of a trumpet has sounded long it now waxes louder and louder it proclaims salamanca one this night is barfield to be illuminated on this day the field head tenantry dine together the hollis mill work people will be assembled for a light festal purpose the schools have a grand treat this morning there were two marriages solemnized in briarfield church lewis gerard moore esq late of antwerp to shirley daughter of the late charles k fieldar esq of fieldhead robert gerard moore esq of hollows mill to caroline niece of the rev mathewson hellstone m a rector of briarfield the ceremony in the first instance was performed by mr hellstone hiram york esq of briar mains giving the bride away in the second instance mr hall vicar of mentally officiated amongst the bridal train the two most noticeable personages were the youthful bridesmen henry simpson and martin york i suppose robert morris prophecies were partially at least fulfilled the other day i passed up the hollow which tradition says was once green and lone and wild and there i saw the manufacturers daydreams embodied in substantial stone and brick and ashes the cinder-black highway the cottages and the cottage gardens there i saw a mighty mill and a chimney ambitious as the tower of babel i told my old housekeeper when i came home where i had been ay said she this world has queer changes i can remember the old mill being built the very first it was in all the district and then i can remember it being pulled down and going with my lake lasses companions to see the foundation stone of the new one laid the two mr moores made a great stir about it they were there and a deal of fine folk besides and both their ladies very bonny and grand they looked but mrs lewis was the grandest she always wore such handsome dresses mrs robert was quieter like mrs lewis smiled when she talked she had a real happy glad good-natured look but she had een that pierced a body through there is no such ladies nowadays what was the hollow like then martha different to what it is now but i can tell of it clean different again when there was neither mill nor cot nor hall except fieldhead within two miles of it i can tell one summer evening fifty years sign my mother coming running in just at the edge of dark almost flayed out of her wits saying she had seen a fairish fairy in fieldhead hollow and that was the last fairish that ever was seen on this countryside though they've been heard within these forty years a lonesome spot it was and a bonny spot full of oak trees and nut trees it is altered now the story is told i think i now see the judicious reader putting on his spectacles to look for the moral it would be an insult to his sagacity to offer directions i only say god speed him in the quest end of section thirty seven end of shirley by charlotte bronte